Happy Friday, everybody. Welcome to the Michael Cutler Hour. I am your host, Michael Cutler. It is Friday, and it is August the 4th, 2017. Always a pleasure to join you to catch up uh, on what's going on in the wacky world at the end of the week. Never a shortage of stuff for us to talk about. So I thank you for joining me. If you're familiar with me, you know that I'm a retired senior special agent with what used to be the Immigration and Naturalization Service, an agency that was uh, largely supplanted by ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, uh, Customs and Border Protection. They have the inspectors at the ports of entry in the U.S. Border Patrol and um, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, the uh, Division of Homeland Security that adjudicates applications for a variety of immigration benefits, uh, political asylum, um, providing aliens with lawful immigrant status, and even United States citizenship, to name the most prominent of the benefits that are offered. <clears throat> Ever since the attacks of September 11, 2001, as you know, I've been truly a man on a mission trying to wake up our leaders, trying to wake up especially our fellow Americans about the true nature of immigration, the true nature of our borders, the true nature of the laws that were enacted by Congress to protect America and Americans from people from other countries who would pose a threat to our safety and well-being. And it's not about xenophobia. Our immigration laws have absolutely nothing to do with race, nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with ethnicity. It's about keeping out aliens who are criminals and spies and terrorists, aliens with dangerous diseases, severe mental illness, fugitives from justice, um, terrorists and gang members, people who would do harm to us, and ultimately people who would either go on welfare, become what's known uh, legally as a public charge, or foreign workers who, if they worked, would displace Americans. That's what the laws are about. And to talk about enforcing the laws is not about keeping everybody from the rest of the world out of the United States, but limiting who we allow in so that we, uh, again, observe all of those concerns that I just noted. And by the way, if you want to go to the law to see what we're talking about, Title 8, United States, if I can get the words out, it's Title 8, United States Code, Section 1182. And, and, And so that's what the law is about. And um, we really need, as Americans, to grow a spine. And when people accuse those of us who understand the significance of borders, who understand the significance of our immigration laws, and make the accusation that you're being anti-immigrant, you're being xenophobic, instead of being a shrinking violet, be very clear about it. This is not about xenophobia, and it's not about wanting to hurt anybody, but it's about protecting America and Americans. We have a serious problem with terrorism. We have a serious problem with transnational gangs. When you look at the hearings about MS-13, and by the way, I have to make the point that most often the victims of transnational criminal organizations are the citizens of, or the, the residents rather, of those ethnic immigrant communities where those criminals tend to live. Uh, The Russian mob generally lives within the Russian ethnic immigrant community. The Jamaican Uh, Drug posses live within the Caribbean communities. You know, this isn't about going after Latinos. It's not about going after a flavor of the month. It's about people. And let's remember something. Human nature is human nature. Skin color is superficial. We all bleed red. And every ethnicity, every race, every religion, every nationality has the good, the bad, and the ugly. Just that simple. You can point to good guys and bad guys from every country from every race, every religion, every ethnicity, to think otherwise is to be foolish. Or worse, or worse, perhaps bigoted. And this isn't about Latino voters. It's bigotry to think that Americans who are Latinos are different from Americans who aren't Latinos. Again, that's an example of profiling bigotry and racism. All Americans, all Americans, and I don't care what your skin color, race, or religion, or even or even your political orientation, if you're at least rational and reasonable. All Americans want our military to keep America safe from the enemies that want to kill us. North Korea, for example. Other countries building weaponry. They're the threat. Our military stands between us and them, and we want our military to succeed. They better succeed. We want the police to keep our streets free of crime and gangs and drugs. You have to be crazy to think otherwise. We want our schools to educate our children, and we want to know that any American, irrespective of what I call the superficial factors, race, religion, ethnicity, gender, any American willing to work hard, study hard, and benefit 
perhaps from a little bit of good luck thrown in for good measure, can write the next great American success story. That's what the American dream is. And that's what we all want for ourselves, for our children, and for our fellow Americans. So we need to have the guts to stand our ground. And when people start the nasty accusations, we as Americans need to stand up to them. We need to stop being intimidated by people who are trying to bully us, intimidate us, uh, and destroy our reputations. There's nothing wrong with wanting to live in a safe and successful country. There's nothing wrong with wanting our children to inherit from our generation a safe, secure, and prosperous America. We are destroying the middle class, and the middle class is the heart and soul of this country. The middle class is what the poor aspire to, and it's from the middle class that many of our leaders have come. So let's understand that middle class is America. I mean, all the factions are, but, but the middle class truly is the, the foundation of what America is about, to build the middle class. And what we have seen for the past several decades is the destruction of the middle class, the willful destruction, <clears throat> because the corporatists, the globalists, want to bring into America an unlimited supply of workers from third world countries who bring with them third world expectations of wages and working conditions. That's exploitation. That's not compassion. That's not compassion. So let's be very clear about all of this nonsense that we keep seeing in the mainstream media. And I think starting the conversation, starting the discussion today, let's take a look at something known as the RAISE Act. Uh, President uh, Reagan, uh, President Reagan, goodness gracious, President Trump uh, was talking about the RAISE Act. And so the RAISE Act is uh, it's an acronym and it's an acronym for reforming american immigration for strong employment act it's s354 if you want to look it up it would cut legal immigration by roughly 50 percent and, and it's amazing because already the there are members of the republican party see people say to me well this guy is a conservative and this guy is a liberal and if you know if they're liberal or if you know if they're conservative then you know where they stand on the issues i have to tell you that's a bunch of nonsense. That's not what we're talking about. In fact, people who are truly um, globalists can be found in both political parties. Newsweek today looked at the bill, uh, the legislation that Donald Trump, that President Trump is supporting. And here's the headline from Newsweek uh, yesterday. They, they sent it out in an email today. Republicans tell Trump your immigration agenda leads to more illegal immigration. That's the Newsweek headline. Now, this is crazy stuff, because if you look at what the president is talking about, and if you look at what the law wants, it's about making certain that we don't flood America with cheap foreign labor, and we stop this notion of what's known as chain migration that comes about from family reunification. So, uh, by the way, the two senators who have proposed the legislation are Tom Cotton and David Perdue. And I think they're right on target with us, because in addition to cutting down on the number of immigrants by roughly 50 percent, in addition to stopping chain migration, and I'll explain why that's only rational and reasonable. I know you're not going to hear those words in most news reports, but it is rational and reasonable. And by making certain that aliens who immigrate legally to the United States to be part of America come equipped with the fluency in the English language. And already this is being described as some kind of xenophobic, racist, whatever. People of every race, religion, and ethnicity speak English around the world. English isn't some minor language as a thought. International aviation, pilots from around the world are supposed to speak English. It's the national language of aviation. And it's not just the Brits and the Americans and the Canadians who speak English. English is the national language for Jamaica and Trinidad and St. Lucia. We can go around the world, all the countries where English is a major language. There's nothing unreasonable in saying to people, if you want to immigrate to America, you need to come to America prepared to be successful. To be successful, you need to speak the language that the majority of Americans speak. We've turned America into a Tower of Babel. That's not good for a bunch of reasons. And something for you to think about, it weakens democracy. If you want to go to college, you have to go to high school. 
and you have to get passing grades and, and better than that. You, they, they, you know, the, the prospective college wants a transcript that shows you've got the wherewithal to be successful in college. You take a college uh, exam, the, uh, the SATs and so forth, to demonstrate your readiness to go to college. You don't go to college and say, well, you know what? I dropped out of high school in the, in the 11th grade or the 10th grade, but I want to go to university anyway. It doesn't work that way. When I wanted to be a federal agent, I had to take the federal service entrance exam. That was the, the brain-crushing test we took way back when, uh, in 1971, when I took that test. And if I remember correctly, it was a six-hour test. And I walked out of there feeling as though my brain had been squeezed like a lemon, you know? It was a tough test. And you had to have a college degree or they wouldn't consider you for the position of special agent because they wanted you to come equipped to do the job. That's what this should be about. The Congressional Budget Office did a study about 10 years ago wherein they said that it costs 20 to 40 percent more to educate children who can't speak, read or write English effectively. 20 to 40 percent more. Our school districts are struggling across the United States. Think of how many dedicated teachers are out there dipping into their own wallets and purses to come up with the money to buy school supplies for their children in their classes because the districts are out of money. Think of how much money is spent on English as a second language because of all the kids in the classes who can't speak, read, or write English and live in families where English is not spoken at home. The damage this does to America and to the American educational system is inestimable. And what it also means, and this is a, an issue very close to my heart, my youngest son has a form of autism, Asperger's. Autism is quite prevalent. And if you look at the statistics, for whatever reason, perhaps environmental reasons, we've certainly done a good job of fouling our nest as human beings, all the pollutants and everything else going on, um, it would appear that autism is on the rise, that children with learning disabilities, ADHD and other learning disabilities need help. My son... Uh, who has Asperger's, just finished his third year of engineering school, and he's part of an honors program. And that happened only because he was able to get early intervention as a child when he was very young. I mean, very young, going back to before he started public school. Early intervention helps many children who suffer from these learning disabilities but every day lost is a day that is irretrievable. You can't get into a time machine and go back and, and take a child who's 15 or 14 or 10 or 5 and make believe that we can undo damage done when this doesn't take place early enough. And increasingly, across the country, money for those early intervention programs are being siphoned off because of the need to put money into English as a second language training program for kids coming into the schools who can't speak, read, or write English. This is hurting American children and their families. This is diminishing opportunities for those American kids who have learning disabilities through no fault of their own. Countries are supposed to make the citizens of their country the priority, not the citizens of other countries. Parents are supposed to take care of their own children before they help take care of their neighbor's children. You don't give money to charity if you don't have the, the money to feed your children when they go, before they go to bed at night. Responsible parents know that lesson, that the responsibility for the parent first and foremost is to care for their own children. Rational, moral countries need to make the best interests of their own citizens their first priority. When Abe Lincoln talked about a country of the people, by the people, and for the people, wasn't he in point of fact articulating that very point? So what they're trying to do with the RAISE Act is to say, look, we're going to cut down on the number of immigrants coming into the United States from a million or more to about a half million. By the way, that million figure by itself is more than the rest of the world combined. So this isn't something drastic in terms of what other countries are doing. It also does not make sense to bring more workers into the country than the number of new jobs that we're creating, yet that's what we've been doing year after year, decade after decade. That's how we wound up with tens of millions of Americans living below the poverty level. That's why one in four American kids now lives below the poverty level. That's why the middle class is in trouble. That's why people lost their homes to foreclosure. American workers being displaced by foreign workers. The RAISE Act is a step in the direction to change that dynamic. 
And consider that in the coming years, more and more jobs will be lost to automation. We're seeing it in the fast food industry, where suddenly we have robots that are able to cook and flip hamburgers. You're seeing more agricultural robots going out there picking the fruit. These arguments about how we need manual labor makes no sense. In fact, there's very real discussions now about so, you know, driverless cars and driverless trucks. So people that drive trucks for a living and buses for a living, their jobs are now being called into question. Increasingly, we will need fewer low-skilled or semi-skilled workers. And this is even impacting, impacting the highly skilled industries because artificial intelligence, uh, all sorts of uh, technological advances are cutting down on the number of jobs in many industries. Well, this is the inexorable price we pay for progress, I guess. But we can't put the toothpaste in the tube. We can't unring the bell. We're moving in the direction of automation, artificial intelligence. We're bringing in far too many people who don't have skills that will enable them to be successful. Far too often, we're bringing in kids who need that EL, uh, ESL training. The English is a second language training. It's hurting everybody else that's attending the schools. If you look at the cascade of impact that immigration policies have, I always make the point that immigration is not a single issue, but a singular issue because of all of the various ways that it impacts the challenges and threats that America and Americans are facing. But I also want to talk for at least a couple of minutes to you about this notion of family reunification. It's been marketed in such a way where most people don't stop to give rational thought to what we're discussing. So, so let's start out by making this point. And, and, I, and I'm forced to think about it when you look at that judge in Hawaii who said that, you know, we, we can't split up grandparents from grandchildren and aunts and cousins and uncles and brothers-in-law and sisters and crazy stuff. They're all part of the same family. So uh, here's a suggestion for you and see how this works for you. Because I've used this when I was on a bunch of radio shows today. Um, I'm doing some more radio in the next few days. I'm glad I'm getting these opportunities to be out there. So, so let me start out by telling you that when an immigrant comes to the United States or any other country coming to live permanently, coming to be a part of the tapestry of that country, it's rational, reasonable, appropriate, and to be expected that the immigrant will bring with him or bring with her their spouses and their minor children. That's just the way it is. You're not going to become a resident of another country and leave your spouse and kids in another country somewhere else. That is crazy. So we have to anticipate that if you give a green card to, let's say, some guy who's an engineer, that he's going to bring his wife and his four children with him from whatever country he comes, whether it's India, whether it's Jamaica, whether it's England, whether it's Colombia, doesn't matter. The guy's an engineer. He's getting a green card. He's coming to America. Of course, he's going to bring his wife and his kids. It would be inhumane and nuts to think otherwise. But that's not what we're talking about when we talk about family reunification, not at least in this context. You may not know this, but when an alien becomes a United States citizen, because all citizens have the authority to petition the U.S. government to permit their siblings to come to America. So understand what we're talking about. We're talking about adults now. Let's say some 45-year-old guy from Australia meets an American woman, they get married, she files for his green card. Three years later, he's entitled to file for citizenship, and he goes and files for citizenship. Okay, fine. Well, now, as an American citizen, he can petition the government to have his mother and his father come here. And we can have a discussion about that, because perhaps they're elderly, maybe he wants to look out for them, maybe he's an only child. There's a bunch of maybes. Maybe they want to help raise the children. Maybe both the husband and wife work. And the grandparents say, look, we're retired. We'd love to help with the kids. I, I might even be willing to see that happening. But when you start to talk about people bringing their brothers and sisters and their adults, well, going back to this idea about nuclear families, they're going to bring their nuclear families here. So suddenly, that newly minted American brings his six brothers and two sisters to the United States. They bring their spouses and their children well, guess what suddenly happens? One new immigrant could wind up bringing in 70 or 75 or God knows how many more people because many countries have families uh, where it's not unusual to have six, seven, eight children. That today is considered business as usual. 
you can bring in all of your brothers and all of your sisters and all of their spouses and all of their minor children. And my question is why? My question is why? Some time ago, I was invited to a debate with some people from the ACLU, and the guy I debated played fast and loose with the facts. It was ugly. And this was up in Chappaqua, a very well-to-do community. Uh, I heard kids talking about their father's jet planes, and this is Clinton territory. You know, all those billionaires that the Clintons uh, hobnob with, but they complained about the, bil- the millionaires and billionaires. Of course, they now live in Chappaqua. And the groundskeeper came to me and told me that he'd been a, a descendant of Thomas Jefferson. And he said, you know, during this debate, the ACLU talked about how many years it takes for people to get their extended family to the United States, their brothers and sisters and so forth. And I said, do you really think that an alien who gets citizenship should be able to bring his brothers and sisters here? He said, sure, why not? I said, okay, do you have a brother or a sister or, or, or multiple? He said, no, I have a brother and my brother lives uh, I think he said in Nevada, wherever the brother lived. I said, okay, when was the last time you were physically with your brother and you had dinner together? He said, my gosh, it has to be 10 or 15 years ago, but we're very close. We're on the phone twice a week. We email each other all the time. We're always sending each other photographs of our families and what we're doing. I said, that's fine. But you haven't been with him in a decade. Imagine if you weren't an American and he wasn't an American, but let's say you came as an immigrant, you got your citizenship, and let's say it's not just your brother. And I said, I presume your brother is married and has children. He said, he does. They said, okay. Imagine you were from Australia or you were from New Zealand or you were from Japan. I don't know. Pick a country. And you happen to have five or six brothers and sisters, and maybe you haven't seen them in years, but because you got your citizenship, they now hit the jackpot. They can all come to America and they can bring with them their wives and kids. Does that make sense to you? And it's funny. Because this guy who just moments earlier thought this was a grand idea said, well, wait a minute, you know, that that might not make sense. I said, no, it doesn't. So here's the standard that I would apply, folks, and you think about this. I believe that the real test as to whether or not an alien who becomes a citizen should be able to bring his extended family here, one question needs to be answered. Could those other people reasonably be put on that person's health insurance plan? You see? Because if you have health insurance, you can generally put your wife and your minor children or your husband and your minor children on that plan. You can't put your brothers on that plan. You can't put your brother's spouses or your brother's children on that plan, right? So why on earth do we tell people, if you get to be a citizen, bring all your siblings to the United States, even if they're half brothers and half si- Come on down, like the old price is right. Why? Why would you want to be able to do that? And why should we permit that when we have a shortage of jobs, a shortage of seats in universities and classrooms, limited resources? This also creates inflation for consumer goods. You know, the more people who try to fill up at the pump, the more the price of gasoline goes up. Many communities have shortages with water. You bring in more people, more pressure on the water supplies. You bring in more people, that puts more people on mass transit, the buses and and the trains and so forth. How does that help America or Americans? That's the question, folks, that our leaders should be looking at before they look at anything else. Does this help our fellow Americans? That's the question. America, the country of the people, by the people, for the people, what people? The people that are worth billions of dollars and look down their nose at us as as, as income generators? Who are we talking about when we say we the people? We the people in order to form a more perfect union. We the people. Government by the people. How in the world does it make sense to flood America with more competitors for jobs that increasingly are difficult for Americans to get? Jobs create opportunities. When we take jobs away from Americans and provide them to foreign workers, we are destroying opportunities for our own citizens. Is that fair? Is that government by the people? Of course it's not. Am I being xenophobic? No. Because, you see, and I know there's this big debate with Steve Miller, and I spoke to Steve Miller a bunch of times before he went went to work for the administration, before Trump even announced. And and we had these conversations, and he did a very good job debating that guy Acosta. Uh, He was accosted by him, I guess. Uh, Again, the reference... There's the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. Wait a moment. 
I was on a radio show yesterday, and they asked me that question. What about the Statue of Liberty? I said, well, God help us if we're going to start formulating national policy based on the poem at the base of a statue, albeit the Statue of Liberty. But when you want to talk about you're tired and poor, increasingly, who are we describing? We're describing Americans. Why is it unreasonable to say, wait a moment, too many American children are living below the poverty line? Wait a moment. We're taking too much money for the programs that are supposed to help American children with learning disabilities and giving that money to fund English as a second language for folks who come here from other countries. Shouldn't the school system be most concerned with educating American children? When you look at Barbara Jordan and the Jordan Commission, for those of you not familiar with her, look her up after this show is over. Don't do it while I'm on the show. Do it after the show. Um, Barbara Jordan was a congresswoman, a Democrat. She was a black lady. She passed away a number of years ago, but she did an investigation into the impact of immigration on America's minority communities, the black community, the American Latino community. And what Barbara Jordan found was that a massive influx of illegal aliens and low skilled workers did tremendous harm to America's poor. Because America's poor, in order to bootstrap their way out of poverty, need to get the bottom rung jobs to work their way up the economic ladder hopefully to ultimately become a part of the middle class. That's the American dream, to go from poverty to the middle class and beyond, you know, infinity and beyond, to the middle class and beyond. But how do you get to the middle class when you don't get your foot on the first rung of the economic ladder because we've been importing too many damn workers from third world countries who will take those jobs for lower wages under worse conditions? So when you take an American poor person, and don't provide him or her with an opportunity to put their foot on that first rung of the economic ladder, you've destroyed their future and their family's future. Do you understand that? You don't go from poverty to working as a surgeon in one shot. It usually starts with a summer job to build a resume, to get the money, to have the money, to go to college and pay tuition, and, and, and so it goes. When that economic ladder is yanked away from America's poor, and when middle class American workers are kicked off the ladder because we're bringing in more foreign high tech workers, the economic ladder itself becomes the dream that becomes unattainable. This is crazy. This is a betrayal. And Barbara Jordan was so clear on this. And she was a Democrat. And the Democratic Party used to stand for this kind of principle to take care of America's minorities and America's poor and blue-collar America. People say to me, Mike, why are you registered as a Democrat? I said, well, my dad was my biggest hero, and my mom, let's, let, let's not leave her out of this. But my pop was a blue-collar guy. He was a plumber by trade, as he would pronounce it. He had undergone, I believe it was a five-year apprenticeship to become a journeyman plumber. And there's nothing embarrassing about being a journeyman tradesman. Tradesmen are every bit as talented as white-collar workers. I would argue they're more talented and more valuable. Forgive me for the redundancy, but when I think of thieving bankers, there's a redundancy somehow in that phrase, uh, telling you about the products they offer, and it's a piece of paper with a scam. Three-card Monty isn't a product. Now, there's good bankers, and they, we need banks to provide opportunities and lend money and so forth. I, I get that. But we saw what the bankers did with the economy in the crash of, 19, of 2008 and, 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 and what happened to the stock market, the greed, the unbridled greed, the subprime mortgages, the whole business. But when you look at tradesmen, they actually build something. The tradesmen built America, whether it's the railroad or houses or factories or the roads, the airports, the hospitals, the schools. Tradesmen did that. And we're bringing in day laborers and they're displacing tradesmen. The quality of the work they do isn't even close, and American tradesmen are losing their jobs and losing their ability to feed and support their families. We're doing this across the board. So Donald Trump stands up with these two senators, with Cotton and, and with Purdue, and says, I'll have what they're having, you know? Let's have the RAISE Act. Let's make certain that if people come to America, they speak English, so it's less of a burden on our schools, it's less of a burden on industry. These people can walk in, they can get a job, they speak the language. I'd love to see English declared a national language. And before everyone gets their, their panties twisted over that notion, I don't want to see a country of one religion. I live in New York because I love diversity. So for those of you that want to say Mike Cutler's a xenophobe, lots of luck with that argument. But we do need a common language. How in the world can we interact 
How can we do business with one another if we can't speak to one another? How do you get into a cab and not be able to tell the cab driver where you want to go? Of course, before the robots take over the cabs. So understand what we're talking about. This is reasonable. You aspire to come to America? Great. I aspire to be a federal agent. I had to get my degree so I could become a federal agent. What's wrong with telling people from around the world, if you aspire to become an American, then you need to go to school. You need to get a valuable skill. And darn it, you need to come to America armed with a working knowledge of the English language so that you're ready to rock and roll as soon as you get here. That's common sense. But you see, common sense went out the window. So you listen to the lies of members of Congress like, like um, <laughs> Lindsey Graham, my goodness. And, and, and you listen to Menendez. Oh, we, we can't do this. You can't limit the number of immigrants coming into the United States. If you ran a restaurant and found out you ran out of food, are you going to still try to bring more customers into the restaurant? Or are you going to try to figure out a way to get more food so the cooks can make dinner for the people that want to come? We don't have enough jobs. But I got to tell you, for all the complaints we're hearing about the Trump administration, and I don't agree with everything Trump does or says, Sometimes I wish you would understand that there is supposed to be some nuance to the English language, but then that's just me. And after all, I am a communications guy. I took my, deg my degree in communications, arts, and sciences. But there was a record number of jobs created, and unemployment is at a 16-year low in the United States. 16-year low. That goes back to roughly the time of 9-11. 209,000 new jobs created. You see, we've got to start to get the American economy moving to help get rid of the national debt because we have a lot of money that we need to spend on infrastructure, on building up the military that was decimated by Mr. Obama, who clearly clipped America's wings when he grounded the space shuttle. I will never forget or forgive him for doing that. My original dream was to be an aerospace engineer. And, and, and the folks that I really looked up to were never sports figures, but the astronauts. The space program is so vital, but now we have to hitch a ride on Russian rockets, even though we have one hell of a screwed up relationship with the Russians. So understand the position that we're in. This takes money. We need to get the economy moving. We need to stop the flow of remittances leaving the United States that go to the foreign countries or the people who come here from other countries to work because they're sending money home, which makes sense for them, but it doesn't make sense for us. So anyway... I think by now you get the idea that I support the RAISE Act. I hope it passes. I hope that enough members of Congress will wake up and remember who voted them into office. I believe it was Mark Twain who said, we no sooner send people to Washington than they forget who sent them and with what purpose. I hope that members of Congress remember who sent them and with what purpose. You know, I, I write for a bunch of websites, and I'm very proud of my relationship with those websites. For years, I've been writing for CapsWeb.org, Californians for Population Stabilization. Uh, I've been a columnist for Front Page Magazine for a number of years now. That's sponsored, of course, by the terrific David Horowitz Freedom Center. I write for The Social Contract. I've been doing some blogging for Newsmax. And, and Newsmax really pleases me because they give me quite a few opportunities to be on their terrific television programs and with the magic of Skype, I don't even have to get in a limousine to go into the city uh, to be in the studio. I can do it from home. Technology is a wonderful thing. And I was on this past week with Bill Tucker, and I, I know Bill Tucker because he used to be one of Lou Dobbs' correspondents back when Lou was over at CNN and I was a regular on Lou's show. Uh, I was probably on his program an average of at least once a month, and very often uh, Lou's producers or his reporters would call me up for advice about stories they were doing even when I wasn't on the air. And they were also using uh, lots of my articles on air, uh, the background material, and that, that sort of thing. So Bill's an old friend. And I was on with him. And the link is up. Uh, I, I posted it on my website, michaelcutler.net. <clears throat> but, you know, um, Bill had me on, and we started to talk about the use of language or the misuse of language. And I said to him that reporters who are unwilling to use the term alien should be fired. Of course, the news organizations so-called they work for aren't about to fire them because they're insisting that they call illegal aliens undocumented or, or whatever, or whatever the Associated Press style book dictates should be used as language. Remarkable. When I was in college, the style book told you about how to do the footnoting and punctuation. Now the style book uh, is straight out of Orwell and Newspeak and telling you what words are no longer acceptable to be used. Uh, folks, this is censorship. And out of frustration, I said, 
that any reporter unwilling to use the word alien should be fired. They, they, they kind of changed the title a little bit, said anybody not willing to report on, on the violent gang should be fired. And I certainly would agree with that statement also. But it's an interesting interview, so I suggest you go over to Newsmax and check it out or go to my website, uh, michaelcutler.net. But I, I want to talk about two other things in the time that remains, and the time always goes so quickly. I'm always happy that you uh, join me. I hope this helps you. By the way, if you find this program helpful, please share the information with as many of your friends as you can. Be part of what I call my bucket brigade of truth, whether you use social media or email people or get on the phone and tell them about it. Please share this information because you're not getting it anywhere else, and it's critical information. I'm going to give you an example why, and it's not because I'm saying it or I wrote it. But I don't owe anybody anything, and I get to speak my mind, unlike reporters that are a bunch of puppets. And some of them have been brainwashed because they've been drinking the Kool-Aid over the use of language or misuse of language or destruction of language. You destroy the words, you destroy freedom. You destroy freedom, you put yourself on the trajectory to tyranny. It's just that simple. My article for capsweb.org, I think you'll like the title, Supreme Court Orders Shields Down, Eviscerating Presidential Authority to Prevent the Entry of Terrorists. We have been hearing from day one that President Trump issued an executive order travel ban for citizens of Muslim-majority countries. Travel ban. That's all you hear, travel ban. The president isn't banning anybody from traveling. What he's doing is suspending the privilege of entry for aliens from countries who cannot be vetted temporarily. But they call it the travel ban. Now, they did not come up with a fake name to describe Obama's executive orders. DACA. Everybody now knows what DACA is. Pretty amazing. D-A-C-A. It's not a real word. It's an acronym. Deferred Action Childhood Arrival. Everyone knows about it because it was reported on. And they talked about how this paralleled the dreamers. By the way, it's interesting. Uh, the A in dreamers is alien, as an alien minor. For, for all this screaming and yelling and brouhaha, oh my God, you can't say alien. The world will stop. Lightning bolts will strike you dead. The American dream was so important to these immigration anarchists that the term alien became palatable as long as that A could be used to spell the word dreamer. The hypocrisy is mind-numbing. Dreamer is acceptable, alien is acceptable, because we are eluding to the American dream. Of course, Americans need no longer apply. But here's my question for you. Why is it that the news media refuses to use the official title of President Trump's executive order? That's a simple question. It's not called a travel ban. Why do they keep calling it a travel ban when that's not the official name? Now, here's what I think, but I'm just a cynic. I think they are adamant about not using the official term because then all the screaming and yelling and controversy would evaporate in a New York minute. I'm serious. So before I tell you, and if you read the article, no cheating, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but before I read to you the name, the actual name that's on President Trump's executive order on immigration, have you ever seen it? Have you ever heard it? Do you even know what it is? It's not travel ban. Okay, so here it is. And when I read it to you, I think you're going to know why they don't want to use the real title. And I promise you there's no curse words. I promise you it's clean language. This now is the name of the executive order that has gone to the Supreme Court and back, and the Supreme Court has decided against the President of the United States, has decided against national security, forgetting that the President is Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces and that national security is his primary mission. Here's the title. Protecting the Nation from Foreign Terrorist Entry into the United States. It just rolls off the tongue. It just rolls off the tongue. Let me read it again. I love the title of the executive order. I think it's a fabulous title. But you're not going to see it in the New York Times. You're not going to see it on MSNBC or CNN or any of the other networks because it provides clarity. And if, and if I said to you that this is the title and where's the controversy, you'd probably scratch your head and say, gee whiz, it sounds like something as president he should be doing. We've seen enough people killed in Europe. We've seen people in the United States, San Bernardino, the Boston Marathon, 9-11, the other attacks. 
Of course you want to keep terrorists out of the United States. Who in their right mind wouldn't? Well, that's a big presumption. Who in their right mind indeed? Read it again. Think about those words that I'm about to read. Protecting the nation from foreign terrorist entry into the United States. We've passed an executive order to keep terrorists from entering. If the president was trying to keep Muslims out of the United States, he is inept and incompetent. Indonesia is not on the list. Indonesia is the most populous Muslim-majority country on the planet. Not on the list. In fact, Indonesia has so many people that are Muslim that the number of people in Indonesia almost is equal to the number of Muslims in those six Muslim-majority countries. Not on the list. Pakistan, not on the list. Saudi Arabia, not on the list. United Arab Emirates, not on the list. Not on the list. Is this a Muslim ban? No. How many times have you picked up a newspaper or turned on the TV? Trump's Muslim ban. Trump's Muslim ban. That's what you're hearing. So I go back to the title. Protecting the nation from foreign terrorists into the United States. Do you understand how Orwellian this is? Please do this. Go to capsweb.org. Look at my article. If you find it interesting, if it makes sense to you, if you think it provides vital information, email it to as many people as you can and tell them to do the same. That's my bucket brigade of truth. Post it on social media and make the suggestion in your posting that people do the same thing. Let's let this thing go geometrically. Capsweb.org. Anyway, I make the point that the Supreme Court and these judges keep talking about they have to have a bona fide relationship and citizens, people, entities in the United States. Terrorists have families. The Tsarnaev brothers attacked the marathon. One brother convinced the other brother to do it. The Supreme Court said you can't keep fiancés out of the United States. Wasn't it a fiancé who fired up her, her, her fiancé to carry out that deadly attack in San Bernardino? What in the world does familiar relationships have to do with this? So I, I ask the question rhetorically, um, does it mean that terrorists who have relationships in the United States are welcome to enter the United States? Because what the Supreme Court and what the lower courts have neglected to address was the purpose of that executive order in the first place. So I, I hope my article, my commentary for capsweb.org fires you up. If it, does, if it does, boy, I'm having a problem articulating words. If it does fire you up, pass it along. Let other people get to see it and give thought to what we're actually dealing with here, folks, because this is really critical. The Supreme Court has stripped the president of an important authority. By the way, imagine if the president gets a briefing and they tell him, we know there are terrorists coming here. They're, car they're traveling on possibly phony passports. We don't know, but we know of you know, four countries, five countries, six, whatever. And then they give the president the names of the countries. They say, we don't have the names of the people. We know they're coming intent to carry out an attack. And the president says, well, tell Customs and Border Protection to not let aliens from those countries into the United States. Up until this decision, he had that authority. Jimmy Carter exercised that authority with Iran after our embassy was overrun. Obama exercised that authority. That authority has been stripped from the president's tool chest. He can't do that anymore. At some point, these boneheaded decisions by these imperious judges are going to get Americans killed. And they will not be held accountable, even as we bury innocent victims. The 9-11 Commission, to which I provided testimony, made it clear that if the immigration system had worked properly, those terrorists couldn't have gotten in, they couldn't have embedded themselves, and consequently, they couldn't have carried out the attacks. The key vulnerability that was exploited, not only by the 9-11 hijackers, but many other terrorists, have vulnerabilities within the immigration system. But the problem is that the United States Chamber of Commerce and a host of other organizations are more fixated with head counts on airplanes and body counts in the morgue. Now we move along. There is a program underway in the U.S. military, and this program um, is about bringing in lawful admitted, lawfully admitted aliens into the military with the promise that if they serve in the military and they have needed skills, we put them on the expedited path to citizenship question that we now have with this is how in the world, and if you go to, uh, I, I wrote about this, by the way, for Front Page Magazine. It was just published yesterday. 
And the title of my article for frontpagemag.com is U.S. Military Infiltrated by Alien Recruits. The subtitle, Pentagon Investigators Discover Fatal Flaws in the Vetting Process. Now, the Pentagon investigators, at least publicly, are not willing to disclose any information about the specifics. We don't know how many of these aliens who went through military training went missing, but a bunch of them did. We don't know what countries they're from. But as you read the report, you can tell that they're using the word infiltration. That the fear of Pentagon investigators that these aliens infiltrated the military with possible hostile intentions. I've written about a comparable program called the Enlist Act. I wrote about it a couple of weeks ago, or I think it's about a month ago. If you read my article for the front page, you'll see it. The Enlist Act, H.R. 60, is pending legislation. Over 200 members of the House of Representatives have co-sponsored it, Republicans and Democrats alike. And some of the Republicans and Democrats have a significant military service behind them. I, I don't know what's in the water they're drinking or the coffee they're drinking, but this is a crazy idea. If people sneak into the United States, they do so to evade the inspections process, the vetting process conducted at ports of entry. The open borders immigration anarchists say that aliens who run the border enter the United States undocumented. There's no such word as undocumented. It is Orwellian. It is Newspeak. They entered without inspection. Let me make this point very clear for you. When I was an immigration agent, if I arrested somebody and if I was sitting at my desk banging away on the typewriter, preparing the paperwork because I had arrested somebody, if my boss walked by and said, Mike, what's going on? If I said to my boss, I arrested uh, a Colombian Iwi, I arrested a, an Uruguayan Iwi or a Mexican Iwi or a Canadian Iwi, or by the way, it doesn't even have to be someone from, uh, from Latin America or the Northern Hemisphere. We arrested people who ran the borders who came from Europe or Asia. But I'm just using those as examples. If I said, well, I, I've got this Uruguayan and, and he's an Iwi, my boss would immediately know all that he needed to know. Because EWI, EWI, was an acronym for Entered Without Inspection, Evaded the Inspection Process. So they didn't enter undocumented. They entered without inspection. They snuck in. They trespassed. To then take that person and put them in the military is an act of insanity. Because you're dealing with thousands of people. Vetting these people is very often next to impossible. We don't know who they are, when they arrive, why they're here. But they're here illegally, and they basically would parallel the dreamers. The approval rate for the dreamers is in excess of 90 or 95 percent. We're talking in that case about 90, uh, I'm sorry, about um, I think it's 800,000 people that I'm aware of. Those numbers may have changed. But I did see a report where at least 800,000 aliens who entered without inspection claimed claim to have entered before they turned 16. See, everyone says, these are kids who entered. No, these are kids who claim they entered. Because you could be as old as 31 years of age and go into an immigration office and say, hi, I'm here, give me the paperwork, or they don't even have to go in. Most of them are just doing it online. So there's no face-to-face, -face, there's no nothing. There's no nothing. And we've been giving them, under this program that Mr. Obama did, the DACA program, we're giving them temporary lawful status. The word is temporary. Everyone's screaming, oh, my God, Trump is going to kick them out. These are poor children. You don't know who they are. And by the way, if you look at how many gang members have entered the United States, either through the surges or whatever, entering without inspection, entering claiming to be people they aren't. Um, this is how MS-13 metastasized since 2013 and, and became the biggest threat that law enforcement is probably facing in nearly all of the states across the United States of America today. So I wrote an article about the Enlist Act and the threat that we face from giving lawful status and military training to aliens who ran the border. We don't know if they're gang members. We don't know if they're engaged in terrorism. We've seen insider attacks in Afghanistan where people in Afghanistan join the military specifically with the intention of waiting for that opportune moment after they're given firearms training of killing as many soldiers as they can. They've done it at police academies throughout the Middle East. Are we not learning the lessons? Are we not paying attention to what went wrong? I believe it was Albert Einstein who said 
that in sanity he was doing the same thing the same way repeatedly and expecting a different outcome. So the Enlist Act is making its way through Congress. It was defeated in 2014. They're at it again. They should call it the Freddy Krueger Act. We can't seem to kill these bad deals. Uh, I understand that um, John McCain wants to hook up with his, his, br his blood brother, Chuck Schumer, to go over and, and create comprehensive immigration reform yet again. If at first you don't succeed, keep trying. It's almost like date rape. How many times do the American people have to say no before you get it? Just like how many times does a woman have to say no before you get it? The American people keep saying no, and they keep saying, well, we're going to do it anyway. So now they want to do it with the Enlist Act and put illegal aliens into the military. God help us. You know, it's interesting because it's a felony. It's a felony for an illegal alien to be found in possession of ammunition or firearm. I made many arrests like that. Many arrests. But we're willing, under the Enlist Act, to take illegal aliens, put them in the military, give them access to weapons, give them access to the best training in the world. And we know there's a huge problem with gang members in the military. We know there's gang graffiti all over the Middle East from our soldiers who are gang members who joined the military. And if you look at the FBI reports and the gang intelligence reports, these gangsters come back to America battle-hardened, fully trained in tactics and, we and weaponry, and they literally are no, the local law enforcement is no match for them. They're using their skills to go after their competition, and they're using their skills against law enforcement in the United States. This is undermining national security and public safety. And these are aliens who are here illegally that they want to do this with now, put them in the military. And meanwhile, we're seeing that even aliens who were admitted into the United States apparently can't be effectively vetted. There's a real problem with the vetting process. What I'm asking all of you to do, if this is upsetting to you as it is to me, please get involved. Please call your congressman and your congresswoman and your senators and tell them, no way. Support the RAISE Act. Do not support the Enlist Act. And while you're at it, call up members of Congress that don't represent you in your district, but nevertheless are making decisions that impact Americans in all 50 states. So if you call up a member of Congress and they say, well, wait a minute, are you a constituent? My answer has always been, in a way. I'm a New Yorker. You're from, you know, wherever, pick a state. But these decisions impact the entire United States of America. So, yeah, I'm a constituent because I'm a citizen. You need to stand up, not just for me and for you, but for our children, for our grandchildren. We need to have our voices heard. Because as I always like to say at the end of my programs, and we are at the end of the program, democracy is not a spectator sport. Please go to my website, michaelcutler.net. Please check out my articles at capsweb.org and frontpagemag.com. Check out Newsweek. They do a great job over there. I was just on with J.D. Hayworth this morning. Always great joining J.D., former member of Congress. Uh, I had the privilege of testifying before him when he was in Congress shortly after 9-11. And um, I hope you find this information helpful. And again, please share it with as many folks as you can. And I look forward to seeing you again next week, right here, same time, on the Michael Cutler Hour. Good night, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Be well. <laughs>